My first stop in Dusseldorf is at the CCD. It's in a beautiful location on the banks of the River Rhine and it's the world's largest convention centre. It's a totally unique offering because of the layout and it's got an arena on site and covered walkways linking all of the buildings including two hotels. Totally unnecessary in weather like this. As we have seen throughout Germany, natural light is key to the convention centre's architecture, with towering windows providing views of the river and surrounding parkland. A more suitable darkness prevails in the Congress Centre though, where the very best and flexible state-of-the-art facilities can cater for up to 15,000 visitors. The most important information is, is there the right location in the city for my event? So you need both, you need, you need a very good uh, uh, location of the right size, on the right place in the city, but you need also the city itself, the atmosphere, the flair and the possibilities after the conference for leisure. And there are two companies which are very strong in their fields. The Düsseldorf Congress, as one owner of uh, the Convention Bureau, has ten locations. It starts from a very large arena, the Esprit Arena, with 50,000 seats available, to the Convention Center, where we are now. That's one part. And the other part is uh, tourism accommodation, very close contact to the, to the hotels. So a client, an organizer will have two competent partners in one institution, uh, the Convention Bureau. Which brings me nicely onto you, Caroline, and your marketing side for, for, for Dusseldorf. What makes uh, this city so, such a lucrative offering for, for MICE planners? Dusseldorf is a great destination because it's incredibly easy. Um, coming from London, I can, you know, make great comparisons. It's really, really, really easy to get around. Uh, we're known as the 10-minute city because transportation system is second to none. Where else in the world can you be from a busy international airport to the centre of town to the Altstadt in 10 minutes? And that's not an exaggeration. That really is all it takes. And for a city so small, we actually have 148 locations where you can hold events and conferences. Um, they range from small cookery studios to historical lofts, the numerous hotels that we have, to the multifunctional congress centre here. And sadly for me, I'm only in Dusseldorf for a very short time, but I'd like to hear from you what the one thing is that you think I should definitely see while I'm visiting. Um, the Museum K21 is a spectacular historical building that has been gutted and is uh, completely contemporary on the inside. I really, really enjoy the contrast from going outside and going into it. Um, but I also really like the Ehrenhof, which is also uh, another collection of museums and a concert hall. It's just a very grand place to be. And it was also the uh, home of the first exhibition here in Dusseldorf in 1926, when we actually had seven and a half million visitors here in the city. For me personally, I would say it's, it's the River Rhine, the promenade, uh, and the atmosphere along the promenade. And you can walk from the convention center to the old town uh, along the River Rhine. It's, it's very close, and that's very nice from my side. I've checked in at the Melia now and uh, after a quick change I'm meeting Ben to go on a rickshaw tour which apparently is the best way to see town. Hi Ben. Hi Natalie, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Come on this in. looks like fun. I hope it is. Okay, I'm a little bit scared. I'll hold on. Good, so let's go. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I feel very lazy sitting in the yeah, back here not nice doing any work. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lovely park. Yeah, it is. One of the oldest public parks in uh, Germany. Dates back to the late 18th century. So is this right in the centre of the city now? Yeah, yeah, we're really in the city. 
Dusseldorf used to be really, really small for a long, long time, and it started to get a bigger city like 100 years ago. So does the park sort of link up different areas of the, of the city? Or? It's linked, it's a good link or a good connection with the old town, which we are visiting, right. and the Königsallee, where we're going. Woo, downhill! <laughs> crossing the big roads. It's yeah. really strange. And this is the old town on our, our right side. Okay. It's a very chic city, yeah. it seems to be. Wow, this is really, really pretty. Yeah. This is the mayor's house. The, the town hall. Town hall. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mayor's house. Oh, mayor's yeah. house, yeah. yeah. So tell me a bit more about the key messaging that you're, you're pushing about Dusseldorf. Well, Dusseldorf is an open town, really nice. Uh, the people are open. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can see, a lot of events that you can be a part of, actually. So after the work is done, there's a lot of things that you can do. So it's serious and fun all the same so time. It's serious and fun, yeah. It's really a good place to do business, but it's a good place to live and to have fun too. Excellent. Yeah. So this is the place where the old castle was, and we can still have an imagination of how the castle looked when you look at that tower over there. And that church right. spire, it's got like a, a right, twist it's twisted. in it. Yeah, yeah, it's totally twisted. Because in a thunderstorm, it was lightning. hit by, light, by lightning yeah. actually, and it rebuilt it, but it got twisted because they used the wood was too fresh that they used. It's so weird, it's like an optical illusion the way it's right. twisted like that. It's like really weird, yeah. yeah. But it's like a, a sign to the city. It's really, you can see it from far, far away. Does when it you're represent what those Dusseldorf people are like? Yeah, a little slightly bit, twisted. Slightly <laughs> twisted, a little weird, but really nice. Really yeah. nice. Very pretty. Yeah. yeah. So, what we see there is the uh, cartwheelers' fountain, because cartwheeling is really an important tradition to Dusseldorf. It's every, basically, every kid can do it. Yeah, I saw it on our schedule and it worried me slightly. <laughs> yeah, me too, because usually people ask me out, can you do a cartwheel? And I'm like, no, I can't do it really. <laughs> but um, let's get off here. I have to show you something. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. afternoon seeing Dusseldorf for the first time and as you can see the nightlife starts quite early here. These guys are making me really thirsty so I've come to meet a brewmaster Dirk. Hi Dirk. Hi Natalie, nice to meet you. And you. Let me show you our brewery and how we produce the beer. Fantastic, I can't wait. Okay, please follow me. Thank you. So here we are in the brew house. To produce the beer we need our for raw materials, we produce, of course, strictly according to German purity law. And uh, we need pale malt. This is pale malt made of barley. Yeah. This is roasted malt. The roasted malt is responsible for the dark color of the Alpi. Okay. The broken malt, the grist, this we mix up with water and to start mesh meshing procedure. And after meshing procedure, we give the hops. These are the hops. Maybe you can smell, it's pretty interesting. Very intense. Oh yeah, smells like beer. And we boil together with the hops and then we can start fermentation. Fantastic. And fermentation we can have a look in the cellar. Brilliant, okay. Okay. Down here? Yes. Oh, it smells really strong in here. Yes, we have two fermentation tubs and each tub is a one-day production. And to produce uh, the, the beer wort we produce in the brew house, to ferment it, we need our yeast, of course. It's a top fermenting yeast. And the beer wort comes from the brew house through this pipe. And we let it in one of the tubs, giving the yeast. And then fermentation starts. Oh, wow. It's like a big pint of beer. This is what we produce each day. And this is what our customers drink each day. So is this ready for drinking as it is? Or does uh, it have to be filtered? No, it has to be filtered and filled in kegs. Here we are in the storage and maturation cellar. I like that we're getting nearer and nearer to the finished product. <laughs> After fermentation, we pump the beer in these tanks. And here it has to stay for two weeks. OK, so you have to be patient to get good beer. This is ready for drinking, but we filtrate the beer to get it clear. 
and then it's ready for filling and drinking, of course. Okay, I'm, I'm getting thirsty and my stomach's getting all excited just at the thought of it. So. Yes. Okay, then we go to filtration and filling. For our own pub here, we fill the beer only in wooden kegs. And these kegs are handmade and uh, around 20 to 25 years old. Wow. And these are 100 liter kegs. Okay, so the beer in the pub tastes different to anywhere else. Yes. Come on, you talk me through the process. You've tempted me enough. You have to give me a beer now. Okay, let's Excellent. have one. Okay. <laughs> Florian, lass uns zwei bitte. Oh, that's very personal service. I can see the colour that you're talking about. It is a lot darker than the beer we've seen in the rest of Germany. Yes, yes. This is a darker beer. Okay. My beer is darker beer. Hey, Prost. Cheers. Get to the liquid once you get through the head. <laughs> okay. It's really good, really tasty. Worth the wait, and thank you for the tour. You are welcome. Okay. Is there a limit to how many I can have? Or? No, it's no limit. <laughs> Excellent, I like you a lot. <laughs> you are invited. second day in Dusseldorf, I'm going to the most modern district in this city, the Media Harbour. I'm doing it in a vintage style on this beautiful bus. Morgan! Morgan. Perfect. You can book these buses. And this one is really a nice one from 1955. Really an easy and relaxed way to go through the city. We're heading to the Media Harbour, which Media is the Harbour. kind of modern quarter of Dusseldorf. Yeah, it's one of the most recently built quarters and recently finished quarters in Dusseldorf. Really like a, a scene quarter, which uh, lifestyle can be lived like going out partying uh, for restaurants and it's just finished it's like the uh, Hafen city in, in Hamburg a little bit but feel a lot, lot smaller and um, the, the name Media Harbour does that give something away is it where the kind of the young trendy media hip companies are based as well exactly um, it used to be a regular industrial harbour till the mid 70s and then the, the city decided to uh, rebuild the whole area and uh, production firms are based there, like TV stations, radio stations, and that makes it the media harbour. All the media is centrated or concentrated in that part of the town. And um, it makes it really like a hip quarter to, to everybody for working and going out. Okay, so the media bit, I should be right at home. Yeah. Maybe not the hip bit. <laughs> <laughs> but the media, you will find it right at home. Yeah, yeah totally. So this is the brick building here on the right side yeah. is uh, one part of the Giri Bauten, as we say in, in Düsseldorf, made by the famous architect Frank O'Giri from oh, the wow. United States. What? And here we're coming into the Media Harbour, have a really oh. beautiful panorama wow. view of it. So here we are. Amazing architecture. Yeah. That's what the Media Harbour is famous for, the yeah. architecture. It's just, it looks like something out of a... it looks fake almost. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> almost surreal. Yeah. yeah. With the old stuff and the new stuff mixed yeah. together. They left some of the old buildings the way they are. But it works really, really well actually. Yeah, it does. The Media Harbour is Dusseldorf at its most forward-thinking and adventurous. When the old industries moved out, the Hafen district threw its arms open to the latest design, with over 10 international architects, as well as the cutting edge of German construction, all working to create a playground for the technical and creative industries. 
It makes for an unusual but perfect place for meetings. As we wandered from the media harbour back into the old town, my luck ran out. I thought I'd avoided one of Dusseldorf's more dizzying traditions, but Ben had other ideas. So remember the uh, cartwheelers that we've seen yesterday? Over, I've shown you the fountain yeah, with yeah. the cartwheelers. And every year in July, the city's looking for the best cartwheeler, the nicest cartwheel. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> you see the six lanes here, and you Natalie are going to enter that competition for the nicest and fastest cartwheeler in know. Dusseldorf against native Diana, <laughs> who is no able chance. to do it. Well, you got a helmet. Like, it, could it could be up against Usain Bolt <laughs> in the 100 meter sprint. Okay, ladies, here we are on your marks. <laughs> Good luck, Diana. <laughs> Get set and go. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, Natalie, not bad. <laughs> Do you need any assistance? Right. Should I give you a hand? <laughs> Did it! <laughs> Trying to talk and segue at the same time is not yeah, so easy. It's not so easy. <laughs> you have to concentrate How on it. How many people in a group could, uh, could the tour guides take? Uh, around 40. Okay. Yeah. And what sort of speeds can we get up to? Uh, 20 kilometers per hour. Wow. Okay, yeah, that's, that's quite, quite fast. fast. <laughs> yeah, let's try it. Meeting you! <laughs> Come on! <laughs> From the ridiculous to the sublime, now dressed for dinner I met for cocktails with Uwe Kirkman, who was keen to tell me about the unique offer Dusseldorf is able to make to meeting planners. We like to call ourselves a global village because the city is very international. We have a lot of international companies here, a lot of international visitors. Also, um, almost 40% of all overnight stays are from international guests. Um, so I think a very important thing is that Dusseldorf is a very successful business destination. Dusseldorf has developed many kinds of industrial sectors and business sectors and now is a capital, for example, for mobile technologies, for telecommunication and of course for business services. So um, we have a great mix of businesses in Dusseldorf that makes the city very attractive and mainly attractive for international investors. So you talked about some of the industries that are present here in Dusseldorf. Do you find that there's a correlation between those industries and the industry events that you attract here? It's not only the, the business sectors located in Dusseldorf that are uh, attracting conventions and trade fairs to the city, but also sectors that are not basically located here, but that have very strong footholds. For example, the printing machinery industry, medical technologies holding world leading trade fairs in Dusseldorf. So this is also a mix of uh, factors, um, sectors from Dusseldorf having influences on the conference sector and of course other industry sectors too. Looking to the future now for Dusseldorf, what's happening in terms of further development to make the city even greater? Dusseldorf is targeting future industries and innovative industries such as the um, mobile sector. Um, we have a campaign uh, promoting Dusseldorf as mobile capital and this is a very interesting sector moving around telecommunication and IT industries. Another thing is that together with the Dusseldorf University, with Heinrich Heine University, we are working in the life science field in order to uh, promote startups from the life science sector to set up business in Dusseldorf and also of course attract international companies from these sectors and uh, since companies are frequently and continuously moving to Dusseldorf I'm convinced that we are making a good job here bringing Dusseldorf to the future. To finish off our Dusseldorf experience, we've come to the beautiful Benrath Castle, where we're going to enjoy what's been described to us as a melody under a sky of stars. <laughs> 